Good evening. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan, get me Victory today is mine. Oh, happiness is mine. Happiness is mine. Happiness today is mine. Oh, when I'm told Satan to get me behind, happiness today is mine well joy is mine joy is mine joy today is mine whoa i told Satan, get me behind joy today is mine well victory is mine Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. As I told Satan, get me behind. Victory today is mine. Well, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. But this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will enter this gift with this given in my heart. I will enter this court with praise. That the Lord has made, and I will rejoice for He has made me glad. Oh, He has made me glad. He has made me glad, and I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has he has made me glad, and I will rejoice, for he has made me glad, and I will rejoice, and I will rejoice, for he has made me glad, and I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. Amen. It is truly a day that the Lord hath made, one that we have never seen before and one that we will never see again. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise and tell him thank you for all that he's done. For you. Do we have any prayer requests this evening? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Pastor Mark. Good evening. All right. Anybody else? Yes. Our Father and our God, we come this evening to tell you thank you. Lord, thank you for sparing us some of the things. Thank you for allowing us to see some things. Thank you for bringing us through a lot of things. God requested the known for individuals as well as entire towns. God, this one particular, city of Aden. Strange things are happening. It's only a matter of time before 
fun and games becomes the loss of life. God, show us what we need to do to make a difference in all the places and in the lives of those who are in the hospitals or suffering the loss of a loved one. God, as we come this evening to prepare to study in your word, we ask that you open our minds and our hearts that we might be receptive to your word, God. So by every word that comes out of your mouth, we need to live by. So God, once again, we tell you, thank you. Help us, Lord. Be with us and stand by us. These and also many other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give God some praise tonight. Thank you, Lady A. Thank you, Deacon Gates, musicians, for lending your gift to set the atmosphere for our class on tonight. We greet you tonight with Jesus' joy, and as always, we are grateful and thankful for another opportunity the Lord has given us to delight ourselves in the study of his holy and his righteous word. We're thankful for those of you who joined us virtually tonight. And we're certainly thankful for each and every one of you who are in the building. It's good to be in the building and on the Lord's side. Um, I'm thankful for our young people who are on their way to class as well. Let's give God praise for them. Amen. Tonight, I want to deal with the second lesson in our series uh, entitled Living life from above and within and as is reflected in your handouts um, on our website for those of you who joined us virtually and on the screen in the building we are we're talking from second peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 14 tonight and this particular lesson is entitled embracing the light of eternity so let me segue into this lesson by reminding us that we of our last lesson, where we begin to talk about what it means to function as imitators of God. Um, and one of the things we concluded in, in our lesson is that to do that, according to Ephesians chapter 5, we have to walk, as the Bible says, um, as children of light, as children of light, Ephesians 5 and 8 was where we landed in that discussion. Basically, what that means is that um, as representatives of God, as reflectors of God's nature to a bleak and a dying world, we do so because the Holy Spirit within us has what we talked about in our last lesson, illuminated us to the regard that we now are aware of what is good, what is righteous, and what is true or truth. And then as a result of that, it's our responsibility to share that with the world. That's our reasonable service in accordance with um, Romans chapter 12. So as we talk about being imitators of God, uh, one of the things that stands between uh, those of us who are called to be imitators and are actually <clears throat> becoming imitators is, first of all, understanding um, that we can, we can effectively reflect God to the world. And so um, tonight, I want to deal with that disposition that might spend more time believing that um, their sin nature or their lack of fervency in walking with God prevents them from being qualified to, to, to accurately represent God or to be imitators of God. That's why I'm talking about embracing the light of eternity. So let me kind of set the context for this. Y'all ready? Set the context for this by talking to you about, first of all, a little bit about the book of, of Peter, right? The book of Peter, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Um, this particular book, 2 Peter, um, was written to respond to some problems um, as a result of the discipline of those who are confessed God or confessed Christ or confessed a relationship with him. Uh, so they started dealing with problems, and both the problems were outside, meaning they were 
they were predatorial toward the church, right? There were issues in the, what we would call the society or the world that made walking uh, with God a little more challenging. There were challenges from outside. And so when you start to read the book of Peter, you'll find that first Peter spends a lot of time dealing with those external forces, those things that came against the church. But when you shift into second Peter, second Peter deals more with the things that have been inside the church. Are you with me? And that's significant. What was going on inside the church was this. It was basically, uh, his, Peter writes to help them to understand what is truth and what is false. Because there are false teachers that are teaching things that are leading to erroneous doctrines. And so the church is now engaged in things that Peter has to write to them to correct because they've allowed these erroneous teachings to permeate their existence. And so as a result of it, um, Peter begins to lift what are the reasons that they're, they're engaging in them. And the reasons are because they are a carnal church. They are a fleshly driven church. So teachings that appeal to the sensual realm, teachings that appeal to uh, arrogance and greed and covetousness, these were all the things that were rising within the church. Are you tracking with me? And so he begins to write to alter that and tell them, listen, these things are happening and they're happening by virtue of infiltration. What do I mean by that? Well, they, they started in those acts against the church, and then as a result, as the church became pressured by those acts outside, internally, now they're starting to contend with those things, and some of those things are now setting up in the context of the church. And Peter is writing to say, hey, hey, you're missing it because you're conforming now right? You're conforming to these things that you're hearing and these things are false. Well, the byproduct of that becomes that we, we begin to embrace darkness. The same thing happens today, right? Within the church universal, there are things that were once challenges to the church that have made their way inside the church. And as a result of that, we wrestle with them. And sometimes we end up embracing some of them and we find ourselves dealing in a degree of darkness. And the reason being is because we've allowed ourselves to be shifted or adjusted away from the light of God or the light of God's word as we know it to be today. Am I making sense? So, so, so second Peter serves uh, more so as an invitation to believers to be diligent, right? In pursuing moral excellence. Let the house say moral excellence. Moral excellence comes as a result of what? Accepting what God has determined. Now, if you remember, if you remember when we read last week, we talked about imitators of God and all the things we can't do, all the things we shouldn't do, what imitators of God do not do. But when it comes to now uh, embracing the light, there were two things that we were told to do. One, we were told to put off the flesh, right? To, to, to put off those things that were connected to uh, the opposition to God. And then we were told to put on, y'all remember that? Yes, no to put on that which was of, of, of good, that leads to good and leads to righteousness and leads to truth. Well, in the putting on, part of the putting on has to do with having the mindset to believe that you can, again, reflect the light of God. Because if you don't believe you can reflect the light of God, then what will happen is you'll buy into anything that is offered to you that sounds even remotely comprehensible. Does it make sense? That was the disposition of the church at the time. So, so uh, I want to begin by talking about to you uh, my objective. Here's where I am. I'm, I'm ready. My, my objective in this lesson is to, to help you consider living life in accordance with God's timetable. Living life in accordance with God's timetable. Much of what trips us up today as it relates to walking with God is that we have a time we want things done. Or we believe there's a time that things should be, be, should, should be done. 
And what that does is it diminishes God's ability to work within the context of God's greatest self. Remember, as we learned about the Trinity, we talked about the eminence of God. That was God working with God's self. And so out of that came the mission of God to the earth and to the church. And so the byproduct of that is we oftentimes will engage the enterprise of God's working and we'll engage it from our own perspective, which means we put time parameters on it. Y'all miss me. See, God sits outside of time, but he works in time. God himself is not subject to time. So when we're, think, when we're thinking about the things of God, we're oftentimes thinking about the things of God in terms of time, but God does not. That's important. Because if you're going to walk in the light of God, right, you're going to have to walk in the light of God, understanding that God is not subject to time. God functions in eternity. Have you ever thought about how it is that the things that God calls for us to do also always require things like waiting and patience? Are, are you tracking with me? You know, the, the old saints just say he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. But nobody knew when right on time would be. Right. That's because we serve a God. Watch this. Who operates in eternity. Right. All that God determines, all that God decides, all that God is, it, it ever does, he does it in eternity. And if we're going to comprehend the magnitude of what God is doing, it requires of us that we get our head out of time and into eternity. Does that make sense? That, that's hard for us. That's hard for us. Because when, when we can do that, what we do is we slip into what, what, is, what, what, what we call infinity, right? Um, what comes to mind for some strange reason is Buzz Lightyear, right? Yeah, everybody know everybody know who Buzz, the ministry of Buzz Lightyear, right? To what? Y'all know that Bible, huh? You know, that? right, <laughs> right to infinity and beyond. But what what that is trying to get us to do is to really conceptualize the work of God, because God works where in eternity, right, and through time. But we can't fathom infinity because we, we are so finite as creatures. We are so concealed and congealed and coined as creatures, and we want everything in the here and in the now. Are you tracking with me? That we cannot conceptualize God's work. So what happens is we miss God. We miss the possibilities of God. We oftentimes miss the destinies that God has for our lives because we're too busy trying to see it in the brackets of our existence and not in the grand scope of God's, God's operation. Are y'all tracking? The third thing that's significant for us to conceptualize is that God works outside of time. He works in, in, in infinity. So, so it's going to take God as long as it takes God, right? And, and you can't put a timetable on God. And, and then God does something to us. He gives us promises, but he never gives us dates or deadlines because a promise is really that which God dangles out there that you might maintain and remain in hope. What comes to mind for me always is um, that, that woman who's been waiting on that bow, right? And he shows up and he gives you that ring. And from the time he gives you that ring, it, it, it signified that you're his and he's yours. Right. Even 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 all along, you haven't gotten to the wedding yet. You haven't made, you haven't gotten to the covenant covenant yet. But because you got that ring on your finger. You accept that it is so. And that's that's the promises of God. That's what God does. God extends to us his promises and those promises are like his ring. And as long as we can hold to the promise. Right. What can we do? We can travel through time. Y'all don't catch me in a minute. Even if it means infinity, because I want what? What God has promised. Am I making sense? That's significant. And I want to throw that seed into your mind because that's what's going to help us begin to understand God's timetable and help us to understand how to walk uh, in the light of eternity. So what is, what is, what is eternal pers perspective? Well, that's what you have when you're standing on the promise. Right? When you're bypassing time, right, and you believe in, in the infinity of God, that you, you have what is called eternal perspective. Simply stated, eternal perspective is God's 
perspective on any issue, any subject, or any condition. Ask yourself the question, what are you going through right now, right? And do you have God's perspective on it? Am I making sense? I was in a, I shared this with the morning class. I was in a conversation um, with one of our members over um, our constitution. And one of the things that was, was told to me was how we got to the development of the constitution, how we've got to the modifications we've looked at as it relates to the constitution. And while we were dialoguing, I said, well, how much of that did we, did we consult, consult the Bible on? Right. As we were developing this, what do we use as the resources? And they told me we looked at other constitutions. We reached out to our national body, our state body, got some information. I said, but how much of it did we really research from Scripture? Because if we're not researching from Scripture, y'all tracking with me? If we're not researching from Scripture that which we mandate as our governing documents, then what we're really doing is not getting God's perspective on matters. Am I making sense? In all thy ways. Acknowledge him and what? And he shall direct thy path. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. All of these scriptures are saying, are inviting us into getting God's perspective. But what I want you to know is God's perspective is always based in his promise. Comes it, it, You've got until infinity to get it accomplished and time has nothing to do with it. Are y'all tracking with me? Eternal perspective is gained through God determined through God determined or God ordained means. I want you to get that. That's how we get eternal perspective. You, you don't you, you, you don't just pick it up at the library. Right. It comes as a result of God determined or God ordained means. I reference these as spiritual tools. Let the house say spiritual tools such as spiritual leaders, spiritual leaders, words of the prophets, y'all still here? Commandments of the apostles. Now notice nothing that I referenced came from Leroy. They're all things that God has determined within the context of his own word that are available. They are tools to the believer to help the believer do what? Get to heaven? No, have an eternal perspective. You will not walk in the light of God. You cannot be, if you were an imitator of God, unless you do what? Walk in the light as dear children, children of the light. But you can't walk in the light if you do not have an eternal perspective. Let me ask you a question. It's, it's a test. Flashlight, light bulb. Moonlight, which is eternal perspective? Moonlight, right? Moonlight. But how many times do we rely on the moon as opposed to relying on a flashlight? Are, are you getting me? And the moon governs, if I go back to Genesis, the moon governs what? The night. And, and the sun, the what? The day, which references for us what? It's the first word. Time. Time. Are y'all understanding? In the beginning, God said, let there be, and there was, but the moon and the sun, they'll come till later. Because there is an eternal light that has nothing to do with time, but all things in time come out of it. Y'all better wake up. Because you serve a God who sits outside of time and does his greatest work in time. So do you rely on a God who's outside of time or do you rely on a God who's in time? Am I making sense? All right. So these can be contemporary as gifts of God, messages of God, and directives of God. I, I, I call these in, the enterprises of God's word. When you come to church, do you come to hear a message or a sermon? Huh? Message. Now think about what you're saying. Right now, how many, if you got a smartphone, lift your hands. You got a smartphone? If you get a text message, right, when you look at it, do you look at it to be entertained or to be informed? Because it's a message. 
Am I making sense? But most people come to worship, come to church, as we say it, and they listen to the word, but they're not trying, they're not listening for a message. They're listening for a sermon. Pastor, you sure did preach. What to preach? Right? No, 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 no. Then what, what then is the, don't, don't miss me. Then what then is the objective of the one who comes to hear a sermon? It can't be to walk in the light of God because they're not trying to hear what thus saith the Lord. Are y'all tracking? Okay, it'll get better. Y'all stay with me, all right? So God's word provides what? Eternal perspective. Eternal perspective. Let's keep working. Living in the light of eternity begins with accepting the eternality of God through the doctrine of infinity. I know that sounds real heavy, but it's really simple. I can tell by the squint in my wife's eyes, I need to say it again. Living in the light of eternity begins with accepting the eternality of God. God is eternal. What does that mean? He was, he is, he will be. Got it? Now, once you accept that, you have to accept that the infinitiness, if that's a word. No, it's not. How you know? You don't know. Right? That God is, that, that infinity is beyond. So you, God doesn't subject himself to anything that is within the context of time. So the eternal God of the Bible has always existed. And what? Will continue to exist in the future. The word, the word for that is El Olam. God is known as the everlasting God. I just tricked you and you missed it. God is what? Eternal. And he exists in, in infinity. But El Olam says what? everlasting God. What does that mean? That means that you have to take God's, watch this, his, 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 his eternalism and you have to put it in time and you have to come to understand that when you put eternity in time, there will be something left over. Y'all are missing me. If you take God and put him in time, God is going to override time because God is what? eternal he's everlasting where time is not when i begin to conceptualize that i'm serving a god who is eternal but i'm serving him in a context where time has bracketed i can always expect god to override y'all are missing me what happens where in time that's the only reason you live in time now, but you expect to go to heaven later. Because you understand it, but you don't comprehend it to the regard that you now live your life based on the fact that no matter what I'm facing, there will be some leftover. You catching me? Okay. So the Hebrew name Olam means forever. Perpetual. Old, ancient implying that there is an infinite future and past. Turn to Psalm 90. Here we go. Y'all been listening to the deacons, but you ain't been listening. Let me tell you what I mean. You ready? Psalm 90. Listen. Lord, Thou has been our dwelling place in all generations. Listen to it. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Now, the old deacons used to pray this way. But I believe they prayed this way because they believed this way. Are y'all understanding? 
that, that, that you're praying to a God that's beyond it all. You're praying to a God that, 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 that's longer than any endurance factor you have to consider. Listen to verse 3. God turneth man to destruction and saith, return ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with flood. They are as sleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. We are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they are fourscore years, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Let me park parenthetically and talk to somebody who likes to live by this scripture. Because we have a lot of people who say, well, we've only been promised. Right? But the reality is, I want you to hear that verse again. Listen to verse 10. The days of our years are three score years and 10. And if by reason of strength, they be four score years, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow for the soon cut off and we fly away. That does not say that you only got them that many years. It does not say that. It says that your, your living is not in the years. Your living is in the relationship. Verse 11, who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to what? Number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom, not count our days. It's not about the counting of days. It's about the application of what? Wisdom in the time you have. Let me finish. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee. Concerning thy servant, O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy works appear unto thy servant, and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Now, if you read Psalms 90 and look at it, what you will discover is that it, it parallels time versus eternity. All that happens to us in time, all that we experience in time, but yet there's God in eternity. So it's, the, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's this. You know this in time, but God knows this a different, different way. You experience this in time, but God sees this in a different way. So it's teaching us to begin to set ourselves toward eternal perspective, not perspective in time. Are y'all tracking with me? That's important. Why? Because you cannot walk as children of the light of God and not understand eternal perspective. Because God only deals in eternal perspective. Am I making sense? Now, so this gives way to what is referred to as the doctrine of God's infinity with respect to time. Am I making sense? Y'all with me, Kadisha? To be infinite, what's this, means to be unlimited. So God then being infinite is also what? Unlimited. And so therefore, if we're being taught that God is beyond time, God is infinite, God is everlasting, are you with me? And we are to live in the perspective of God's eternality. We then are never, should never be in a posture where we are without anything we need in time. Are you, are you with me? You have all sufficiency in God because God does not, is not subject to time. Okay, let me, let me not get excited because I feel myself going, going astray. Let's walk, with, walk this. So the doctrine teaches us that time does not limit God. And it doesn't change him in any way. 
God acts before time. Right? We'll, we'll go to Ephesians in a minute, but I, want, I don't feel like doing this. So if God acts before time, and God has not had to adjust to time, so whatever God has determined in eternity is so always. So our walking in the light is an invitation to walk where? Yes, in the eternality, right? In God's perspective. Are you living your life as a child of God in the perspective of God? Or do you have your own perspective? Do you have the world's perspective? Because what Peter was writing to tell them was this, and I'll show it to you in a second. He was saying to them, listen, your problem is you have lost your perspective of God. And so now you are allowing other perspectives to give you your directives. Are you tracking? I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show it to you. Just give me a minute. Right? Uh, in fact, let's just go there now. Let's just go there now. Go to 2 Peter. You there? 2 Peter? Chapter 3. All right. Listen to what it says. You ready? Okay. He says, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your what? Pure mind. So what is he saying? He's saying, I wrote to you about that external stuff. He says, now I'm getting ready to write this second letter to you. Having already dealt with all that exterior stuff, now I'm going to deal with what's happening on the inside. What's going on in the inside is you've lost your what? If I was preaching this, I'd say, have you lost your cotton pig in mind? No. Your pure mind. What is pure mind? God's perspective. You have shifted away from understanding the eternal perspective of God, and now you're being moved by circumstance and situation despite what you understand about God. Let's walk it. He's not right unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of what? Remembrance that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken when? Before, by the who? Holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Now, remember, what did I tell you was the problem? The problem was they had allowed other teachings from outside to influence the inside. And so now he's calling them back to the God perspective, and he's showing them the tools by which they receive the God perspective. Beloved, I can tell you today that the church don't appreciate the tools. If the church appreciated the tools, we would have more people here on Wednesday night than we do on Sunday morning. Because you don't get the tools on Sunday morning. You get the tickling on Sunday morning. <laughs> but you don't get the tools. Are y'all understand what I'm teaching? All right. So watch this. You're not going to get, you're not going to get the stamina and strength you need to walk in the light of God showing up every Sunday. You have to study to show thyself what? Approved unto God. Your imitatorship of God will come as a result of your embrace of the word, which is his will. Y'all tracking? Okay, so watch this. He says this, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own what? Lust. Right? scoffers. So what are they going to do? They're going to hear you stand on the word of God and say, ah, oh, that ain't nothing. No, that ain't, that ain't right. Right? And I, I, and I like the fact that he says, know this first. Why? What's that invitation to? That's an invitation to watch your relationships. Y'all are mighty quiet. 
you ought to, I, we were teaching this morning from the last lesson, last week's lesson, and, and, and where we were told we need to watch the people we connect to. Why? Because there's some people who will ridicule your faith. There's some people who are going to scoff. You going to church again? Do you have to go every Wednesday? Are y'all understand? You can, you, you can skip Sundays, can't you? My gosh. They're scoffing, all right? Don't, don't, don't hit them with, but the word says, the word, yeah, well, no, we ain't talking the Bible right now. That's a scoffer. Y'all ain't going to say nothing. All right. All right. He says, know this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. That's the reason they do it. They walk according to the flesh, not according to the will and the way of God. Right? Verse 4. He says, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Okay, look at me. They're going to say to you, right? Where is the fulfillment of what you say God said he's going to do for you? What's the problem? Time locked. I thought you said. I thought you said. Where is it? Are y'all tracking? Now, that's what happens. Watch this. When promise is deferred. When promise, when, when it doesn't come when you want it to. Okay, don't look at me like that. Place the order. Place the order, let them tell you to be there in three to five business days. In three to five business days, you looking outside and the package ain't on the porch. <laughs> now you want to what? You want to call the company? Why? Because your expectation of time was not met. Are y'all understand? Okay, so, so, so let, let me keep working. He says, uh, verse 1, saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. That is, listen, listen. He just described the earth before God said, let there be. Are, are you with me? Now, he's setting us up. He's setting us up because he's taking us back to a time we weren't in. Are y'all with me? Right? He's, he's taking us back as far as our time can go. Only to tell us something. Watch this. He says, um, verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. What did he just do? He says, the heavens have always been. The habitation of God is as eternal as God is. But everything else that exists beyond that will perish, shall perish, has perished, but God has not, and his habitation has not. He's setting paradigm. He's pointing to what? Eternity in comparison to what? Time. Okay. Then verse 8, here's where it shifts. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. What is he doing? What is he doing? Take a wild guess. To God, to God. Now watch this. This is, some, some people call this a riddle, but it's really not a riddle. 
is setting perspective. He said, now understand this, right? A day to the Lord is as a thousand. And a thousand is, is unto a day. He's setting perspective of God. Because a thousand is really, is really symbolic for infinity. Right? It, it's the same comparison. But he's putting us in the posture to begin to comprehend the eternality of God. Now, y'all try to stay with me. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, you'll get this. I promise you. All right. Verse, verse, verse nine. The Lord is not what? Slack concerning his promise. Now, what did he just do? Verse, verses eight and nine. What do they do? I'm, I'm going to bring it to you. In Almost. Almost. So, 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 exactly. He's helping you to embrace living life in his eternity. Right? He's setting it up. Listen, the promise is there, but a day unto the Lord is as, as a thousand. So, settle in that the, into the promise being so, no matter how long it takes. He's building a sense of confidence and, and for us to be able to live in, that, in, in, in the embrace of that eternity. Why? Why? Because one, it's not a work for us. It's a work of God. And the priority of our, of our living is God at work. Are y'all tracking? Okay. All right. I, I don't, let, let's keep working this. I want to finish this. I'm going to go to verse. Um, he says, the Lord is not slack concerning this promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering what? To us word. What does that mean? So, so the time God takes is to our benefit. We can't, we, we can't expect God to move in any other way except eternally. So we have to embrace living in the light of God's eternity such that we know the promise is sure. So we must stay disciplined and diligent in those seasons where scoffers say that ain't going to come. That ain't going to happen. Doom is going to come to you. Not, if we, not, not to those who walk in what? The light of eternity. Our lesson is embracing what? Y'all don't know. The light of eternity. I've repeated it seven times now. Y'all still don't know. All right. Let me, let, let's keep one. Or so Lord, thou slack concerning this promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us work, not willing that any should perish. Let's talk about that. So then what does perishing look like? To give in to time. Exactly. To give in to time. When we give in to time, we're perishing. Does that make sense to us? Wave at me if you understand what that means. We're in the process of perishing. When we put it on the clock, y'all, when we put it on the clock and lose hope, we're already perishing. That's why I'm, that's why I'm teaching the lesson I'm teaching. You got you, you to gotta understand that God is long-suffering. God will wait. If I were preaching it, I would tell you, remember, Jesus, Lazarus has died. You need to, get, you, 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 you need to come to Bethany, man. He waited. Right? He waited. Now, 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 some would say he waited and then he showed up to, miracul to miraculously raise Lazarus so that everybody know he was powerful. Nope. He waited. Watch this. Fully aware, having told the disciples Lazarus was asleep. And he said, it was good for your sakes that I was here. So the benefactors of Lazarus' death wasn't Lazarus. It was his sisters. 
the disciples, the townspeople. Are y'all understand? Because he, he didn't want any to perish. Yes, sir. They were able to learn of him because of that. That makes sense? Y'all, y'all tracking? Okay. Okay. Man, let me tell you something. Yeah? I, don't, I don't know if you know how to shout on this lesson, but, 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 but the reality is, is now, there's nothing more powerful than your hope. Your hope in God built on your faith practice, the application of faith based on what he has promised or what his word has said he will do. That's, that's, li- that's living in the light of, of, of God. Right? Not living according to the sun or the moon, but the light. Okay, light of eternity. Okay, so let's, let's keep track. Um, he's long-suffering toward us, not, that, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repent. What is repentance? See, we only know repentance in terms of sin. Right? It's, 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 it's the reestablished relationship with God. It's not just coming away from sin or coming out of sin. It's being reconnected to God. Right? It's a turn as we talk about. It's a, it's, 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 it's a 180. Not a 360. Y'all get that? 360 takes you right back where you were. So 180. All right. All right. Um, so what's this? He's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us were, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be what? Dissolved. What manner of person ought you to be in all holy Conversation. Now, the word, their conversation basically is your disposition, your dealings, your living, your your expressions. Okay, and godliness. Y'all tracking? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So, what he's saying here is this. Our disposition should be that of walking in the light of eternity, understanding that all things that is not that are going to be dissolved. Right? You can't put your hope on things in this world. You can't put your, watch this, you can't put your hope in heaven. You got to put your hope in God. And you have to live out of that that conviction and that disposition. Verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth what? Righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace and without spot and blameless. That's that's living in the light of eternity. All right. Let's let's go back. Um y- 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 y'all with me? Okay, I'm gonna do this. So let's go back to, to the to, to Ephesians 1 and 4. Let's turn there. I'm gonna put this together for you. Just just hang in there. So, understanding that God operates in eternity and invites us into the conviction that we may live in that eternity with God, right? We, to, to build that mentality, you have to understand that God is before all things. He's before all things, Ephesians 1 and 4, right? 
according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, what am I saying to you? If before the foundation in, the, in eternity, God has chosen you that you be holy, all of your unholy living can't stop that except you stop living in the hope of that eternity. Did y'all catch that? I didn't hear what you said, Sister Gates. When you give up hope, you lose, you lose your opportunity to live into what God has already determined you to be. What I'm trying to show you is it's not on God. It's on us. And what the enemy does, he, he comes and says, no, no, you can't do that. And if you buy into that false view of your relationship with God, you will conform, you will surrender, you will give up, and you will miss on what God has already determined concerning you before the foundation of the world. You got to lock that in. You, you ought to square your shoulders and say, I'm, listen, I'm holy from before the foundation of the world, so no matter what I go through, no matter what I do, no matter what happens to me, that's not going to be resolved. When you put that in your mind, right, it changes the way you what? The way you live. The way you live. This isn't the truth. Uh, this isn't the truth that Ephesians says. Jesus confirms that God acts before in John 17, verse 24. Turn there. What does he say? Father, this is the prayer for believers. He says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me when? Before the foundation of the world. Jude 25, let's go there. Jude 25 is, is, we call it a benediction. We say it sometimes and some sort of it every week. You there? So the only wise God, our Savior, be what? Glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and when? Amen. Amen. Y'all tracking? Nope. So, so th this, this is the doctrine of infinity. Um, it gives for us what I call a different vantage point for living. Am I making sense? The, I can promise you that if I stand up there with Khadijah and look over the balcony, I see things differently than the engaged does sitting here. Am I making sense? And if I was preaching this, I would tell you there were a plethora of times, right, where Jesus went up into a mountain. He was led up into the mountain, right, about to be tempted, led by the Spirit to be tempted of the devil. He sat in the mountain with the disciples. He was teaching vantage point. Vantage point is important. The vantage point you have of your life is important. If you have a low vantage point of your life, you will live out of that vantage point. But if you have a high vantage point of life, if you have a godly vantage point of your life, you get the privilege of living out of that vantage point. Am I making sense? So infinity's viewpoint is what we should desire. Isaiah 55, turn there. Are y'all getting this? Okay. Are there any questions, Khadija, from my virtual audience? Do they, do they seem to be tracking? There's nobody sleep on the screen, is there? A few people sleep in the building, but. Isaiah 55. Mm-mm. You understand what I mean by 
Vantage point. Listen to Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. What does it say? For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are what? Then the earth. So are my ways what? And my thoughts, then your what? Whose vantage point governs your life? No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. no. He, he'd like to. Your perspective of God. Do you have God's vantage point of your life? That's what the invitation is. The scripture is the invitation for you to view your life through God's eyes. No, to see your life as God sees it and to live out of that. Say, huh? It's not for God to do, it's for you to do. If your doctor tells you what's possible for you based off of medical science and you don't want to be in the condition you're in, you have to accept the doctor's what? Vantage point of your life and make the adjustments. The same is applicable with God. God is not looking at you to see if you're dotting I's and crossing T's. He know you failed. He knows you're falling short. Well, what he wants to know is, will you look at your life from his vantage point? Because if I've fallen from his vantage point, what? He will pick me up. Will I reach for him or will I waddle on the ground? Again, just to set context, I'm purposely not shouting. Uh, because what, what I want you to get is we're talking about embracing what? The internal might of God. You got to embrace it. We are seated. I got to hold on. I got to breathe before I say this because I'm ready to run. We are seated together with Christ in heavenly places. So why are we being dominated by earthly stuff? We don't have the right vantage point. Can I tell you that the Bible's invitation, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Here it is. Who thought it not robbery to see himself as equal with the father, but made himself up. No reputation. That's an invitation for us to think high. Exodus 3, go there. I ain't going to holler because y'all ain't going to shout. <laughs> so you revving up, revving up. <laughs> You, you'll see in Exodus chapter 3, God, God teaches Moses this, this truth. Uh, verses 13 and 14. Here's what he says. And God said unto Moses, <laughs> let me back up. Let me back up to 12. No, let me back up to 11. Y'all with me? I won't go no further. I won't go no, I promise you. Moses said unto God, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, M Moses had a low view of himself, you know. And he said, certainly I will be with thee and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Verse 14. 
And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Uh-oh. Did you get it? Did you get it? Let, let, let me help you get it. While you worrying about how they going to see you, he says, what you need to do is go let them see me. I ain't, no, 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 no. It ain't about, no, it ain't, no, not in you. He says, when you show up and they ask you, who are you? You tell them who sent you. Are y'all understanding? The perspective that matters is God's. In a nutshell, what he says is we ought to think, watch this, heavenly while maneuvering earth. Years ago, I preached a message. Um, go heavenly on it. Go heavenly on it. Everything you face, go heavenly on it. If he's seated there, why go Calvary on it? Go heavenly on it. Get his perspective on the circumstance. When you go Calvary on it, are you going to identify as the pain of it? You may get the victory of it, right? But conquering comes from the heavenly view. Am, am I making sense? I, I, let me finish this because I don't want to go back to it next week. DJ, we're going to move on. God's timing and his promise, yeah. So watch this. When it happens is on you. You got that? What happens is on God. Why is that? Because he's given you the ability in time. To manifest what he's dealt, what he's defined in eternity. I ain't gonna go back to Second Peter, but he says, "Us." He says, "You." He goes from us to you. You can read it. It takes time. It will be challenging, but holding on to the promise is your responsibility, right? You, I made a note of Abraham and Sarah struggle. Remember them. Their problem was they tried to what? They tried to rush God. They were time sensitive. So the failure to walk in faith during time slows down the promise. Don't leave here without that. The failure to walk in faith in time slows down the promise. The more you deal with doubt and disbelief, the more, the, 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 the more you trepidate, right, causes the promise to slow down. But it doesn't change the promise. That's the good news. I was, I don't know who I was, who I was listening to, talking to, watching somebody. And they made the statement, it doesn't matter how long you've been living. If you haven't received what God has promised, don't stop looking for it. Here's a, here's a fallacy. What you got to do is avoid forfeiting the promise. And you forfeit the promise when you fail to walk by faith. And you fail to live in the light of, 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 of God's eternity. Hebrews 11 and 1, y'all know what it says. What does it say? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So the obedience of faith is required. The, the obedience of faith is required. You got to look into the absolute nothing and believe something's coming out of it. 
You got to look at what is impossible and believe that the possible is coming through. Why? Because there's something else determined, watch this, something else prescribed in eternity that is not yet manifested in time. And you're living your life in the light of eternity. So no matter what you see in darkness, what? Light's coming to it. Right? You got to trust the promises of God. Let me, let me leave that there. I, I want to I give you this disclaimer so you, you understand what's going on. Um, these lessons are inter, intertwined. Right? I'm in a series. Right? And, what, and when, I'm, when I'm teaching a series, I'm on my way somewhere. I'm taking you somewhere. And we're not going to get there all at once. Right? So these pieces of paper that you're getting, hold on to them because they're, 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 they're pieces of a puzzle. And there's a bigger picture that I want you to see when we get to the end of this series. But, but the objective is that you begin to understand your life in a context that where you are able to walk in the light of God. You're able to be an imitator of God. Your salvation through Jesus Christ is resolved. So now you're letting people know what's possible with God. Am I making sense? That's not just out of darkness. It's conquering darkness. All right? All right, I'm going to stop there because there's no more slides. And, uh, <laughs> and if I had some more slides, I would do those too. Any, 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 any thoughts, reflections, comments, or questions? Any virtually? Then let us pray. God, for your word, we are thankful. For this time, we are grateful. For how our hearts have received the seed of the word. God, we are most gracious. We ask that you continue to work the seed in our hearts that we may become doers in our lives. Lord, help us to gain your perspective of our existence and to relish it to such a regard that only it matters, even above our own perspectives, but certainly above the perspective of others who do not know what you have prescribed for our existences. Continue to bless our lives that we may live from above and within and not be subject to what's around us, to be in the world, but not of it. God, continue to bless this place we call Mount Carmel with your presence, your power, your will, and your way. Permeate all things connected to it. Right our wrongs, Father. Teach us your ways, but most of all, get your glory out of every endeavor of this place. And we ask that you continue to touch lives, change lives, save souls, heal, set free, and deliver of those who enter this place or are connected to it. We ask blessings, God, upon those who are in faith fights. Lord Brother Felix, we ask you, the Heavenly Father, to Hold him close to you. We pray, oh God, that you would touch every life that stands in need, those we know of and those we know not of. Let your presence be felt in this world as many things, God, point to what the Bible describes as last day occurrences. We're grateful that our faith looks up to thee. We ask that you be merciful as across humanity. But please, sir, don't change your will, but help us, Lord, to change to agree with it. As we prepare to leave this place, let us never escape your presence is our prayer in Christ Jesus' name. All God's people would say amen. Amen. Yes.